Hey, it's amazing uh, to see the kinds of things that have gotten attached to Easter, and I assume everyone knows what, uh, what peeps are. You all know what peeps? You, how many of you like peeps? How many of you think they're, like, awful? Okay, that's just interesting. They're so um, polarizing. If someone wants these, they'll be sitting here after the service. But, you know, because I don't really want them. Because here's the cool thing about peeps. Like, tomorrow, heads up, you can buy, like, a case of these for a nickel. Okay? <laughs> But Americans buy 1.5 billion of these each year. Yeah, and it's, and it's only the third highest like, uh, bought candy at Easter time. And also the great thing, if you buy these tomorrow, or even if you pick these up after the service, um, you can use them next year, and they will still have the same shelf life. <laughs> like they never go bad, I don't think. The other thing that comes around Easter that's a little unusual, and you may, you, you may not pay attention to it, and it doesn't happen as much as it used to, but, uh, you know, as a pastor, these things get my interest. But this is the, kind, the time of the year where, like, news outlets um, for stories like this, especially in the old days when you had Newsweek and Time and stuff, it was always the time of year where you had a big article or a big headline, like, who was the historical Jesus? And there's all this talk about who Jesus was really. And they do documentaries and they interview all these scholars and theologians about who Jesus was really. And there are a lot of people who have opinions about who Jesus was and what he came to do. And those are valid discussions. But if you remove one event from the life, if you take the resurrection and you set it aside, then you know that's all fair game to ask who was Jesus really and what did he come to do? Like, is he a was he a philosopher or a prophet or, or what? And you can sit around arguing, you know, with your friends about who Jesus was, and there are about a dozen options if there's not a resurrection. But if there's a resurrection, then it becomes a really short discussion. I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, if somebody comes back from the dead and they tell you who they are, I'm on their team. If somebody comes back from the dead, I suggest we take their word for everything, like even if I don't understand it. See, if you put the resurrection at the end of Jesus' life, then there's no discussion about who he is because he told us who he was. If you take the resurrection off, then he's just another Jewish rabbi who said some things and died. But here's the deal. The resurrection is what takes all the random events of Jesus' life and makes it into a story. Without the resurrection, all we have are a bunch of like random events that don't go anywhere. It's like a, it's like a stack of, of big puzzle pieces, and you can, you, know, you can put them together to make them look like anything you want them to, and that's what some people do, and that's a fair thing to do if there's no resurrection. But as we're going to see, once you add the resurrection, the discussion is over. Once you add the resurrection, all of those random conversations and events in the gospel become one story. And I'll tell you something else, and I'll talk about this later, but the resurrection doesn't just take the random events of Jesus' life and make them a story. The resurrection takes the random events of, of your life, of my life, the painful events of your life, the stuff that makes no sense in your life, and makes it a story as well. And if there is no resurrection then you don't really have a story. So today we're going to look at a story in Luke about some people who did not believe in the resurrection. And so consequently, they were left trying to put together the story of Jesus to decide who was Jesus based on their own like abilities to interpret the events of his life. And the amazing thing about these people is that they knew Jesus. These men and women from the first century were eyewitnesses who experienced the teachings and miracles of Jesus, they didn't just you know, read about it, but if you subtract the resurrection, his life didn't make any sense even to them in the first century, to his followers. So let's read this story together. It's in Luke chapter 24. It's in your outline. It looks long. It well, kind of is long for what we normally do, but the sermon isn't any longer than usual, so you're good, okay? And, and before I read it, let me just remind you how Luke started his gospel like when he started writing down, the first thing he writes about is how he talked to so many eyewitnesses so he could put together an orderly account of the life of Jesus. It's an incredible book, but here's what he writes in chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared 
and went to the tomb. So Jesus has been, is dead. He's been laid in this above ground tomb. These women who knew Jesus well, they go to the tomb and they take spices to finish preparing his body because he was buried so quickly on Friday and then Saturday was, was the Sabbath. And so you know, now was the time to go and finish what they had been doing because they didn't have time before to do that because of the timing of Sabbath coming. So what were these women expecting to find in the tomb? Yes, Jesus, a body, right? Exactly. These were not women who thought, hey, don't worry, he's going to rise from the dead. Don't bring the spices. He's, he's all good, right? These were women who hung out with Jesus, and they went to the tomb expecting to find a corpse. And they went to the tomb, and it says they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And the next verse doesn't say they threw their hands up in the air and said, Rejoice, he's risen from the dead. That's not what we find. Verse 4, while they were wondering about this, like this is so incredible. Luke tells us that nobody expected Jesus to rise from the dead. Even his closest followers went to the tomb expecting to find a body because it's like game over. And even when they found the stone rolled away and the tomb empty, they still didn't put it together. They just stood there going, huh? Wonder where his body went. No clue. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, now this is a funny question when you think about it in English, why do you look for the living among the dead? You know why that's a funny question? Because they weren't looking for the living among the dead. They were looking for the dead among the dead, weren't they? We were looking for the dead among the dead. We didn't hear about him dying. We saw him crucified. And then after he died, we saw a Roman soldier stick a spear into his side to make sure he was dead. And the reason we're here looking for the dead is because we saw him die. The reason we brought these spices is because we're sure that he's dead. And the angels say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, and then they quote, you know, what Jesus told them earlier. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then, it says, they remembered his words. And this happens to us all the time, I think. Like on several occasions during Jesus' ministry, he told his closest followers, hey, look, I'm going to have to suffer. And they just kind of filtered it out. No, 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 no. You know, at one point he said, I'm going to suffer and die. No, just stop it, Jesus. Like, I'm going to suffer and die and rise up again. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Do you know what I'm talking about? And what happened is when you read the Gospels, and we do this all the time in our own lives, in their heads, they had a picture of what was going to happen. Jesus is the Messiah, and eventually he will reveal himself to the whole world and throw Rome out. Israel is going to be returned to its former glory. They were expecting a real, literal kingdom. And every time Jesus talked about suffering, they just, you know, filtered it out. I mean, I mean, maybe you don't, but I do that all the time. Like, I hear something about something that might set my plans back, and I just keep charging forward, right? At least that's what my wife says. One time, Jesus told them about how he would suffer, and Peter said, oh, no, you're not. Jesus, do you realize the Jewish people have been waiting like a thousand years for you to get here? You're not going to die. Things are just starting to come together. They just would not hear it. So when he died, they didn't say, oh, this is part of the plan. He told us all about this. We just got to wait a couple days. No, when he died, they were devastated. I mean, this was the guy who raised Lazarus from the dead. How could he die? This is the guy who healed illness. How could he die? And then when he died, they assumed he was dead and dead for good. Verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, so the women headed back to find the rest of the disciples, they told all these things to the 11, that's the 11 disciples minus Judas, and to all the others. Now, who were the others? Well, there were about 120 or so people who followed Jesus throughout his ministry. They weren't part of like the inner circle of the 12, but they followed Jesus nonetheless. And when he died, you know, they were dumbfounded and they sat around like, what do we do now? 
because they had put their lives on hold for three years following him, thinking that the Messiah is here, and now, boom, like in a matter of hours, he's gone. And so they've gathered together to figure out, like, where do we go from here? It says it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and others. That's interesting because Luke actually gives us names of real people because this isn't a fairy tale. This is a true story. You can go ask them, you know, if you're alive back then. Who told this to the apostles? Now, you would expect that if the resurrection was a made-up story, the apostles would just go along with it. But instead, verse 11, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Like, look, ladies, like we saw him crucified. He's not like just dead. He's dead, dead. And not only did we see him die, we saw them prove that. Like they half embalmed him up there and put him in a cave and sealed it for a couple of days. Like we know he's dead. We're upset too. Just go. Like they don't believe them. They had no reason to expect that Jesus was alive. Verse 12. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Again, Peter's looking into an empty tomb, and he's not going, oh, he's risen. Instead, he's wondering, I wonder where his body is. Verse 13 is where we pick up the story, and maybe you haven't heard this part before. Now, that same day, two of them, and them is part of the others that were waiting with the disciples when the women showed up to tell them the tomb was empty. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So these guys basically said, hey, we're out of here. I mean, you guys can talk about what's next, but there's no next. So we're just going home. They leave Jerusalem to go home. It's about a seven-mile walk. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And so just, just imagine, like, Jesus walks up. They don't recognize him because of some sort of supernatural thing. We don't really quite understand that, but they, it prevents them from recognizing him in the moment. And so they start telling him about himself. Verse 17, he, Jesus, asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Like they're so discouraged. I mean, they've heard that the tomb is empty. Peter said the tomb is empty, and yet they are downcast, so depressed. Do you know why? Because they had an ending to the story all figured out. And it didn't end the way they figured. And so consequently, there's no story anymore. Verse 18, one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he said. And this is great. Like, Jesus is baiting them, right? He, like, what are you talking about? Well, have you been living under a rock? Everybody's talking about this. Everybody knows about the arrest, the crucifixion. And Jesus says, well, tell me about it. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And they start to tell Jesus the story of Jesus without a resurrection. They begin to tell Jesus the events of his own life, minus a resurrection, which leaves them hopeless and discouraged. It makes them feel like they've thrown away three years of their life. There's no discussion about, oh, he really taught some, some good things and he was a great moral example. Let, let's just go tell the world about him. No, they said, we're going home. It's over. And if he died the way we saw him die, then there's no point in taking anything he said seriously. But listen to what they said. Jesus was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people, I mean, when this guy spoke, we thought like he was the one. And Jesus is going, really? Well, tell me more. Isn't this, isn't this, I think this is funny. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Interpretation, he was not who we thought he was. It didn't end up the way we thought it would end up. And now we don't know how to put the story together. We have a pile of puzzle pieces and there's no box top. 
And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Now let me tell you where this is going. This is a group of people who are trying to sort out who Jesus is, and at the end of all their sorting out, they were not encouraged. Because in light of all he said, it made no sense that he would be crucified. Here's why. Because it is the resurrection, not the teachings of Jesus or the examples of Jesus, it is the resurrection of Jesus that makes all the random events a story worth telling. Like even in the first century, people knew. Like if he's dead, there's no story. There's no message to be repeated. Let me tell you why this is so important to us. You see, at some point in your life, for a lot of us it's already happened, but you're going to stop what you're doing and you're going to ask this question. What am I doing here? Like what is life about? Where is life going. And you probably won't ask in your 20s because there's so much of your life ahead of you. You might ask it in your 30s, but I guarantee you around 40, you're going to look around and ask, does this go anywhere? Or is this just more of the same? Because you're going to look back and you're going to realize, hey, I was born, I worked a lot, now, I lived for vacations and weekends. I may, you know, maybe you were blessed to get married and have children or not. But there, there doesn't seem to be any purpose behind all of this. It just keeps going and poof, my life will be over. Like one day, if you haven't already, you're going to realize, like, oh no, Lion King is true. Right? It's like the circle of life. It just goes round and round, and where it stops, nobody knows. I'm just caught in this circle of life, and you're going to look in the future, and it looks just like the past, except now you're just older. And there might be a little more money, and maybe a little more fun, and maybe a few more vacations, but also things don't work as well, if you know what I mean. And one day, boom, it's over. And my kids, you know, they come along and they have the same thing I had and then their kids come along and experience the same thing and then it's over. Like there's going to be a sense of hopelessness and purposelessness because if life is just a circle, if there's no resurrection, if there's nothing more to this life than this life, then someday you're going to find yourself saying, oh no, I'm like this is it. Like, even if things are working out for you, great. There's a sense of it's just a big circle if there's no resurrection. If Christ rose from the dead, if there is more to life than this life, then you have reason for extraordinary hope. And what these first century men and women faced up to is what many of us face, and the people in our culture want to stay too busy to face. If there's no guarantee of eternal life, then there really isn't that much to this life. You have no story, because a story is linear. All you have is a circle. So listen to what Jesus does. I think this is cool. Verse 25, he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And they're going, what? What are you talking about? Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? He's asking, how did you miss like that whole part? about how the Messiah had to suffer. Like, you're all upset because this man you believe so much in suffered and died. Don't you understand that that's part of the story? It's not an interruption. It's not the end. You shouldn't be hopeless. This was all part of the script. Verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he begins to talk. Let me tell you guys a story. It begins with Moses. You remember Moses, right? Led the nation out of Israel, out of Egypt. Do you remember what they put over the door just before they left? Well, yeah, you know, they put blood of an innocent lamb. Right. Do you remember when Moses gave people the law and he said, hey, when you break the law, you're going to have to make a, a sacrifice? Do you know what they did to those animals? Well, yeah, I mean, they killed them. That's right. Do you remember all the prophets reiterating that when there is sin, there has to be a death because the death 
atones for or buys some time with God. Do you remember that? And Jesus walks them through the entire Old Testament, and then he brings them up to date and tells them the most recent story. Hey, remember when John the Baptist showed up and he said that he was the prophet to announce the coming of the Messiah? Well, yeah, of course they knew that. They probably met John the Baptist. Well, do you remember when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sin of the world? If this this one you're telling me about is in fact the Lamb of God, then what had to happen to him? I guess he had to die. That's right, because if he was the promised one, then he had to die for the sins of the world, just like all those animals that had been sacrificed for generations that foreshadowed the coming of the one who would not just give a down payment, but would actually pay for all the sins of the whole world. And so as Jesus is telling, you know, his story, these guys feel something on the inside. This was, there was this sense of hope, a sense of maybe this is part of the story. Like maybe this makes sense after all. Maybe watching him die is in fact a part of the story. And these guys get so excited that they invite Jesus home. Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, hey, stay with us. It's nearly evening. The day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures up to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, seven more miles. Now it's dark. There they found the 11 and those with them. You have to picture this, the 11 and those with them who had just been sitting there all day going, what do you think happened? Anybody got any ideas? Who was Jesus of Nazareth? James, what do you think now? It's been three days and they have no idea what to do. And suddenly these two guys burst in saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And suddenly the random events that made no sense like come into focus and what was a pile of puzzle pieces become a picture. What were random events become a story. And I'm telling you, it's the event, not the teachings. It's the event of the resurrection that makes the life of Jesus a story. And it's the event of the resurrection that takes the randomness of your life and takes it out of the loop and makes it linear and makes your life a story as well. And here's why. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, it communicated to the whole world that what he said about God the Father could be trusted. Because anybody who has the power to take his life back up again from the dead knows the Father. It means that you can call God a good father. It means that God really hears your individual prayers and God knows your name and cares about you because that's what Jesus taught. It means that his death was not like any other death. It means that his interpretation of his death can be trusted. He said that his death is the final sacrifice for sin, that his death paid for all of our sin. He can be trusted because he took up his life again. It means there's something called eternal life. It means that this life is not all there is, that there is something beyond this life. That's the significance of their resurrection. Isn't that amazing? So I'm telling you, as as Christians, everything we believe hinges not on a teaching, but on this one event. And that event is so crucial that not even the men and women who knew him could make sense out of his life without it. So let the philosophers, you know, pontificate, the historians talk about it, let news medias do specials all they want, because without a resurrection, there's a lot to talk about. But if Jesus rose from the dead, case closed. He's who he claimed to be. So listen to me, Christ's resurrection makes sense of his story. And when you place your faith, your trust in Christ, his story intersects with your story. Because Jesus says, if you'll place your faith in Jesus, you know, in me, I will give you the gift of eternal life. You can live this life knowing where you'll spend eternity, the life after this life. 
And so I just want to give you an opportunity to make that decision. If, if you can't, you know, point to a time in your life where you cross that line of faith, then we hope you'll do that now. Like starting your journey with Christ is pretty simple. Jesus says it's by placing your faith or trust in him. Jesus said, if, if you would like my story to intersect with your story, all I want you to do is make the decision to transfer your trust from yourself and your goodness to what I did on the cross when I died for your sins. I just want you to place your confidence and your faith in my death as the payment for your sin and then follow me the rest of your life. Jesus paid the price and now we are called to receive that price and follow him wherever he leads. And when that happens, his story and your story intersect and he has promised you the gift of eternal life. A promise we know he can keep because he took up his life again and resurrected from the dead. So if you'd like to do that, I just ask that you join me in prayer. You can repeat this in your own heart and mind after me. Heavenly Father, I believe that you are my Heavenly Father. I believe that Jesus was your Son. I believe that when he died on the cross, he died for me, for my sins. Right now, I place all my faith in his death on the cross, the payment for my sins. Receive me into your family. I accept the gift of forgiveness. Now may you help me follow you, Jesus, on whatever path you take me. In Jesus' name, amen.